you have your intro call. I set it up as I am interviewing them. It changes the dynamics and it changes my mindset. So I will start the call and be like, hey, I'm so glad we can talk because I'm at the point in my career that I pick my clients. So I really want to have this chance to make sure that we're both a good fit to work for each other before, because to be successful, we need to be a match. So it changes the call because now I'm an equal, they're not interviewing me. I've elevated myself, even if it wasn't true and I couldn't pick my clients and I say that, I become more valuable. And then during the call, it's not, will they hire me? Will they give my, me work? I am asking, is this a client I think I will be successful with? I am so excited to bring you this interview between me and Jennifer Goforth Gregory. She is the author of The Freelance Content Marketing Writer. She also runs the Facebook group, The Freelance Content Marketing Writer, that has over 7,000 freelance writers who are sharing ideas and supporting one another. I've been part of that group and I've seen so many incredible informational posts. I have Jennifer's book. So as you can imagine, this was a really exciting interview for me. And you know those people you listen to and you're like, they know what they're talking about and it's kind of undeniable. This is one of those interviews. So if you are looking to level up your freelance income or you feel stuck, listen to the advice and the gems that she is giving us in this interview because it's seriously super valuable and I had several takeaways that I'm going to implement right away after our conversation. So let me know what you think about it and hit subscribe below. Make sure you are getting access to all these interviews as soon as they drop. Let's just get right into it. Jennifer, thank you so much for joining me. I'm super excited about this interview because I'm part of your Facebook group. I have your book. Oh, <laughs> thank you. And I have to say, out of all the people giving writing advice online, your blog posts are probably the only ones that I actually read in full oh. because they're so value packed. So I'm super excited to be interviewing you. And I just want to learn about your background and how you got into writing and the type of writing you do. Well, thank you so much for having me here. I'm really excited to be here as well. So I started as a technical writer, which I sucked at and the tech field was terrible. Then I had kids and after my kids were born, I wanted something flexible. So I started my own freelance business, worked for a local newspaper here for a few years. And then as I was freelancing as well, and then moved into content marketing writing in 2015. So 2008 was when I started my freelance business. 2015, I broke six figures for the first time and have hit right at 200,000 the past two years. Awesome. And what inspired you to, well, first let's talk about the book and kind of what inspired you to write that because the book is, I think, geared more toward, correct me if I'm wrong, journalists who want to get into content marketing. No, it's geared to anybody. So it's set up so that you can be a journalist going to content marketing, or it can be somebody who is a marketer at a company wanting to move into content marketing or a new freelancer wanting to move into content marketing. So there is a section on it about moving into, because I think there's some special concerns for journalists, but it's really, it's really for anybody. Got it. And I wrote it because someone made me. What do you mean? I didn't want to write it. And my friend told me I was being selfish by not writing the book. Wow. I love it. <laughs> so I wrote the book. I did, I did not really want to write it, but I had everything in the blog and, and it was hard for people to find. And I really wanted to help people. So I thought it'd be easy to turn a blog into a book, but it, it's not. <laughs> I've heard that before. I've heard other people say that, that they, they thought that turning their blog posts or their email newsletters or something into a book would just be simple, but it's not at all. Well, if you weave it together to tell a story, then it's not because there's going to be missing pieces. You have to have the fabric that goes together. Right. It's not just tacking a bunch of existing posts into a book. Correct. And I, I, I ended up having to do a lot more new writing than I expected. And the, I'm planning on updating it this year as well. Okay. Very cool. So, Cause it's five years old. Yeah. And it just needs a refresh. What inspired you to create the Facebook group? <laughs> because my friend, Stephanie, the one that made me write the book, she asked me my marketing plan. And, and I said, Oh, well, I'll start a Facebook group and people will join and buy my book. 
And she said, it won't work like that. And it's kind of funny because it really has. I started it to help people and to, to sell the book. I mean, sort of to promote the book, but to help people. I was doing free consultations about five or six a week at that point, And it was becoming too much. And so the Facebook group was also a way to help people without me getting on the phone with, you know, 20 people a month. Yeah, way more scalable, I would assume. And it, I never expected it would be the place for freelance content marketing writers. The reason I found you is actually, there's so many Facebook groups out there on freelance writing, but your name had been thrown around and you have a very distinct name that's very memorable. So it stuck in my head and I was able to look you up, find the Facebook group and then purchase that's the book awesome. on Amazon. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, no, that's how a lot of people find it as well. Or I'm very active in ASJA, which is another way people find me. What have been the biggest aha moments in terms of mentoring and giving advice to newer freelancers? Because that's who's going to primarily be listening to this. And I know that's your audience in the Facebook group sometimes. So a couple things. One is I can tell really quick if someone's going to be successful within the first five minutes. Wow. You have to have a persistence, a stubbornness, a, I'm not giving up. I'm going to figure out how to do this and be successful air about you. And you have to be willing to treat it as a business. It's fine if you want this to be a hobby, a little extra money, but if you want to make serious income, you have to have that, that particular mindset. The other is if someone doesn't know their niche, it's going to be really hard to be a content marketing writer. You can be a generalist, but the way you do that successfully is having multiple specializations or niches and then presenting yourself as an expert in that field. So you can have six niches and feel like you're a generalist, but you need, if you're presenting, if you're going to a farming one of my good friends is very successful. She has, she's a journalist, but one of her niches is farming. So if she's going to a company that sells farming equipment, she's not going to mention her dog and business post. She's going to mention her farming expertise. So it's all in how you present it. Yeah. I, I find that that's one of the more highly debated pieces of advice in the freelance writing industry is about whether or not you have to choose a niche. And I still, to this day, can't understand why anyone would argue against it, why anyone would argue in favor of being a generalist writer. But I think it's because like you said, they're mistaken. They're mistakenly thinking that having several niches makes, means you don't have a niche, but you do have niches. (laughs) You can have 10. It's just a matter of how you present yourself. So you can be a generalist. You just have to present yourself as a specialist based on who you're marketing to. And you can be both. The answer is either it's all on how you present yourself, but you do need, this is the thing. People say you can write about anything. That's not really true in B2B content marketing. Right? It, it's just not. If you're writing to experts in the field, that can be true to B2C. But if you're in B2B, you're writing to professionals in that industry. So you do need some expertise. Yeah. Do you do any copywriting or are you 100% content writing? So I do do some copywriting. I do some emails and I'm working on a copywriting project right now for web pages. So I do do some emails and I do do some social media posts, which I consider copywriting. And I do some web page content. And did you get into content writing first before copywriting? Yes. And I don't market myself as a copywriter because I'm a good copywriter. I'm not a great copywriter. So I create brilliant shit. And that's not me. I can create good solid copy. And you in B2B you don't always need brilliant, if that makes sense. You don't need the tagline that's going to change the world. Yeah, they are two pretty different skills, but it's interesting because they do fall under the same umbrella. And I think, and let me know what you think of this, because this was just my journey. I got in the door with blog writing, with content writing, and eventually pitched copywriting projects to the same clients. And I think it's a little harder to come straight out the gate 
unless like, cause I had no experience. So to say like, Hey, let me write your website was a little much to begin with. And so I like to say one new thing. So you can have a type of deliverable, you can have a client and you can have a, knit, a topic. And so if you're writing for a brand new client about a brand new topic, that's going to be really hard. If you're writing for a client, if you're doing a blog post for a client, you know, in a new niche, you can probably do that because you know the type of writing and the client. So that's why I say one new thing. Yeah. yeah. And so what you did there, copywriting was new, but the client was the same and the niche was the same. So it was right. okay. Right. Uh, and that's what I've done as well. The copywriting I've done is for B2B tech and it was both for clients that I was already working for. And I'm a B2B tech writer as well. What is your outlook on other niches beyond tech? Because I almost feel like tech is one of those things where everyone's like, okay, well, of course you make a lot of money. You're in tech because it is a pretty like high paying niche. But do you think there's really such a thing as a high paying niche or what are your thoughts on that? Oh, absolutely. I think the less sexy and less people that can write about it, the more you can command. So if someone's hiring me for cloud cybersecurity, you have to have some knowledge to do that. And there's not that many people that can do that. And so I, they're going to pay me more. And the, the, it, a lot of it too is the value that the client pays, places. If it's a specialized field, specialized topic that's very technical, they're not going to bat an eye if they think you're writing about coffee. Well, anyone can write about coffee in their mind. So I absolutely, and also the less writers that you're, that are in that field, it, the, the, the higher you can command because who else are they going to go to? Yeah. I think a lot of people get into copywriting and content writing saying like, I want to do health and wellness, which is like our mental health. And those are really fun right. niches. And I think that's why it makes it a little bit harder. There's a lower expertise level for entry for those. So no, ab absolutely. I totally agree with you. And, and I think that if you like writing about mental health and wellness, then, then do that and pair it with a higher paying niche. So I say, feed your soul, pay your mortgage. And your pay your mortgage stories work shouldn't be something you do just for the money. But like, if you hate tech, don't go into tech. But I like tech. Do I love tech? No. Do I enjoy it? Is it interesting? Yeah. Yeah. So that's what you need to aim for in, in your niche is something you enjoy, but you don't have to love it. Yeah. I think for tech, because I'm the same as you, I, I'm not reading like tech magazines and I'm not obsessed with this niche, but it is like a fun puzzle. And what we really write about is the outcome of tech, not necessarily, unless you are a technical writer, like you started out as, but right. we're more writing about how technology impacts the end user, which is more human. Correct. And there's, it's, it's, I don't have to know the, the undercovers. Occasionally I will, I can go more technical than I used to and will sometimes write for developers and that's a little different, but, and that's where you can really command it, the money. You can, I mean, if you can write for developers in a way that's understandable, you can name your price, but very little of, I'd say 5% of my work is that. The other 95% is about how tech create, improves business outcomes. Something you, what I really love about the Facebook group and the value you provide is that you're pretty upfront and transparent about your income and your earnings. Mm -hmm. But I'll be honest with you, what you earn can be very intimidating to some writers yeah. who are like, how does she actually make that work? So yeah. can you so, peel what, why do, So why do I share it? And, and this is, so I think there's two questions. One is, yes, I know it could be upsetting to people, but this is the thing. It shouldn't be. And if you're intimidated by it, then you need to, you need to take a pause and reframe it. I'm sharing it not to say I'm better than anybody else. I'm saying it's possible. And most people don't even think those numbers are possible. And so, and I could name $2,200,000 writers without even thinking. It's very possible. And 
several of them are not intact. They do B to B, but they're not intact. And I bet half of those go some B to C. But I can't because I I suck at B to C. Why do you, Why do you say that? I don't know, but every time I write B to C, I get fired, so I stopped. Do you think it's like a, a huge? I guess. I mean, would you say there's a huge difference between B two B and B two C writing? I guess it has to be a little bit more casual. I, I wish I knew, but I've stopped trying. I honestly am, am not sure, especially the times I've tried to go into. I, I can do B two C if it's kind of tech businessy related. Like I've done some stuff for entrepreneurs on Square, but if I tried, I tried to write about like making pillows and feeding fish. Oh my gosh, it was horrible. <laughs> I love that. I think it's also great that you're just honest saying like what hasn't worked for you. Cause I don't see a lot of writers talking about their failures, to be honest. And this is the thing we have to, because, because people think, what it, so it's, so you're going to get kicked off a project. It's not going to be a fit. You're not going to, whatever it's going to happen. And if you're, if people don't talk about it, then they think it's them. And it's, it's not that I suck. It's, that, so it's not that I suck. It's that I, and this is what we're going to talk about when we talk about client retention, I think the biggest thing is, is picking your clients well. I didn't pick the right client. I didn't pick the right client that's, a, that's a good for, for my strengths and weaknesses. And so that's the issue, not that I suck. And so I think people have to reframe it. And I, I talk about my failures all the time for that exact reason. I had a super huge client tear something up and basically tell me that I need to find a new job and that if it was up to him, he would fire me and track changes. Wow. <laughs> I know, right? I saved it as blanks, mean comments. But yeah, he wasn't a fit. They weren't a fit. And it actually, it was just more of a, a style thing there, but because what I did wasn't that awful. But but I'm not going to be talked to like that. But we have to talk about our failures. We're human and we're not going to be a fit for every client. And if a writer's acting like they are, they're lying, in my opinion, or they're not putting themselves out there enough and they're not taking any risks to try anything new. Yeah. So, and, and back about the income, when I first started talking about it, I hesitated for that reason. But back, I guess, 10 years ago, a friend of mine took me, I was... I was saying that I was so excited. I earned $75 a story and a friend took me aside and she's like, that's terrible. Oh she's God. like, you need to be earning 75 an hour. She's like, that's terrible. You earn 75 to hundred an hour. And I was like, oh, wow. I didn't know that. I thought this was great because I was earning like 25, 30 an hour, which was better than I would have earned in other jobs that were from home that were flexible. And I had a master's degree. So I, even then I was still equating it that it was good. And that changed my my career because she told me my earnings sucked and we don't know until someone tells us I never thought 200,000 was possible till my writer friends made it what would you say you and the other writers who are earning upwards of $200,000 do differently than somebody who continues to struggle? Is it is it partly a compound interest and time thing where you've just been doing this for so long that the wins pile up or is there something else so it's persistence. It's always marketing. Every writer I know that is in the 200,000 range has a very strong network of other writers and clients that they've worked through for years. They get most of their work from referrals. Most of them have a specialized niche. Most of them are faster writers. And actually, they're all on the faster side. They don't overwrite, if that makes sense. They don't spend 10 hours on a $100 blog post. And they drop clients that aren't a fit and are low payers. You have to actively drop clients. You have to move up. I, I think of it as a stair step. You start here and you move up. And a client that pays you $100 a blog post isn't going to pay you $500. So you're not going to be able to raise your rates to here. You have to drop clients and find new ones. But it's not starting all over because you're building on them. Back when I first started, every single clip, I would sit down and say, how can I use this clip to make more money? Who can I pitch? And when I was pitching, I'd be like, what clips, what stories can I pitch that will help me make more money? And so I was very strategic for about two years with everything trying to stair step it. So when I, answer, you, I went all over the place. I hope I answered the no, question. 
That's super, super helpful. Are you saying that when you would cold pitch, you would always kind of include an angle of your own and give them an idea of what you wanted to write? Not really what I meant was, so at the time I had a client, so here's a great example. I, I had no tech clips, but I had worked for IBM and I worked in the tech field for six years. I had no clips. And so what I did is I got put on a business project with American Express Open Forum through an editor that knew my editor at the newspaper. And I got on it and I realized that I needed to move into tech, that that's where the money was. And, and I knew it, but I needed clips. So I started pitching some stories about tech a little bit. And then I also found that some publication, a publication called Hospitality Technology. And so I pitched some hospitality stories to American Express Open Forum, used those clips to get into hospitality technology, started out at cybersecurity and cloud, and then used that to move back to IBM. Okay. So you kind of like parlayed past work into future. Absolutely. And my whole goal was I need clips about cloud. I need clips about cybersecurity. I need and then how can I use that? And and when I was in hospitality technology, so when I was talking about pitching, it's with existing clients. I don't usually cold pitch ideas. I cold pitch myself. I don't have to do that anymore. That's really a good tip. I would say asking for referrals is probably like my absolute weakest point for some reason. And I, I don't know what this is. I hate asking people for favors. Especially okay, so you're not, you're not doing them a favor. They're not doing you a favor. You're doing them a favor. Okay. Because you're helping them. By asking okay. them to refer you to yeah, their- Yeah, because they're helping a friend. True. Okay, so so did you work for agencies? I work directly for the client. Okay, so, so let's say the client you work for, there's different departments, right? And yeah. what about if the buddy over in a different product needs help and you say- our clients don't think about referring us. We have to let them know. So you're not asking them for a favor. You're helping them help their company. So the buddy over there may not even mention the need or know the need. So what I always say is, hey, I want to let you know I have some availability coming up. Do, are there any other projects in your company or departments that could use some help? Okay. That's really good because whenever I think of referrals, I think of, Hey, do you know someone else at another company who needs a writer, but you're saying pitch internally and hop from department department, essentially. Correct. So, and that's really true. If you're like working for an ad or marketing agency, because they have 30 projects, if it's a big one, but you would think that they would talk to each other and know that this person has tech and needs somebody. Sometimes they do but not as much as you would think. Because one time I saw a job ad for a company that I worked for all the time looking for a tech writer. And I was like, why didn't they call me? I got my feelings hurt. And then I emailed them and they're like, oh, we didn't even think about it. So I emailed them and then they put me on the project. I really like that you said that because that's my first inclination is like, oh, if they thought I was so good, they'd refer me on their own. No, they don't. And so what they'll do too, this happens to me all the time. So but like, oh, great. I'd love to have my They'll send that email to project managers to let them know I'm available. Oh, wow. Do you? <laughs> You're helping them. They need good writers and they want people they can trust. That's right. Do you? Do You're you not say... asking for a favor. They have a job to do. Right. It's, it's really, it's about their bottom line and how yep. you know, they can provide value. And it makes them look better if they're able to refer someone to help on a project. Yep. And so, and I'll also say, feel free to feel free if you know any colleagues at other companies or agencies looking to share my name. And I, I've gotten that as well. When you ask for that referral, do you just say like, hey, you know, I have some free time as a reminder, here are the services I offer. Here's my portfolio. You can just forward this out. Or do you just say, here's my portfolio? It depends on the my relationship with the client if it's one that I don't know very well I'll let them know my my I'll let them know my niches if it's some I, I usually it, if I have niches that I like so telecommunications is one that I knew there was a project at that company so I said by the way I do telecom it's always good to remind them of other things you do because they forget that yes for sure that's that's so. a great strategy and I 
I love that we're talking about this because I offer an online course that teaches new writers how to cold pitch and how to go about yep. finding companies to cold pitch. Mm -hmm. And I have a sales background. I was in tech sales before transitioning to tech copywriting. Yep. And I think something that I don't touch upon in my content in general is retaining clients, keeping those existing existing clients happy, asking for referrals. And it sounds like while cold pitching will get you in the door, I think it's those existing client relationships that really make the difference between a six-figure earner and somebody who's scraping by. So tell me about client retention and relationships. So one, I think it's being flexible. So and there's a boundary there's a balance between flexible being flexible and having boundaries so it's knowing what you're not willing to do and what you are i'm super flexible I, I get back with people i ask questions and i actually offer unlimited revisions which i know most people say not to i've never had a problem with it very much maybe once or twice but then i let the, the client but i manage them actively so i offer unlimited revisions but you have, my two rules are, we have to have an outline. Well, actually there's two rules. We have to have an outline. Everybody who's going to sign off on the final project needs to sign off on the outline of the first draft. And there needs to be somebody that will look at the comments and consolidate in case there's any differing opinions. Okay, so you're, you're saying, Hey, I'll do as many re revisions as you want, as long as we're all clear on what the assignment was to begin with, because that's where the revisions sometimes get out of control. And I say there's a dip and I have this in my intro call. I say, I offer unlimited revisions, but here's how I work. And I say, now there is a difference between a revision and a change of scope. I said, if it's a change of scope, then we have another conversation about usually X some extra money. And she, they're like, absolutely. And I, if it's an agent, I just think they'll have change orders. And they're like, absolutely. And I said, what I usually do to determine if something's a revision or a change of scope is I will write the assignment brief again in my head. And is it the same as the original? If it's not, then it's a change of scope. So it's being flexible, but it, it client retention goes back to picking the right clients, in my opinion, because so my ideal client's not going to be your ideal client. So I'm not going to retain somebody that isn't a great fit for me. I'm just not. But if you are a good fit for me in all the different ways, then you're going to keep me on for years. So I think the biggest thing we can do is know our strengths, weaknesses, and goals. And then when you get a call and you have your intro call, I set it up as I am interviewing them. It changes the dynamics and it changes my mindset. So I will start the call and be like, hey, I'm so glad we can talk because I'm at the point in my career that I pick my clients. So I really want to have this chance to make sure that we're both a good fit to work for each other before, because to be successful, we need to be a match. So it changes the call. Because now I'm an equal, they're not interviewing me. I've elevated myself. Even if it wasn't true and I couldn't pick my clients and I say that, I become more valuable. And then during the call, it's not, will they hire me? Will they give my, me work? I am asking, is this a client I think I will be successful with? And so there's several things that I think um, help create that. One is communication style. If you hate talking on the phone and a client calls every day, like spontaneous calls, y'all aren't going to work because they're going to be frustrated. You're going to be pissed. Not going to work. If you have a client, so I need to hit, I need, I can't work with someone that I don't ever talk to. I need to hit, see them in person. I need to have at least one call. Even if we talk once and then do email, that's fine, but they have to be a person to me. So I can't work with someone that's just email. So that's one communication style. If you don't want to be on someone's Slack channel and they require it, and that's what they want, then you're not going to be a fit. You're going to be frustrated or they're going to be frustrated. The second is turnaround time. If you work for a client that is not, that has quick turnarounds and that's not your style, then it's not going to be a fit. I love quick turnarounds. I build myself as that. I think a week is a long time. I like three or four days. I don't like clients that give me three or four weeks because I take the whole time and then I do it the day before anyway. So I might as well get more done and have a three or four day turn. 
Yeah. The work expands to the time you give it. That's the biggest thing that was mind blowing to me to learn about this profession is like the short turnaround time is stressful, but you might as well just do it. And and that's a key for me making more money is because I'm more productive. And so that's one. The other is tone. If you can't hit a client's tone, they're not going to like you. So you need to look at their brand voice. I think there's three main tones, snappy, business, boring, and professionally conversational. I don't do snappy very well. And so I I look at that. We talk about it. I don't usually take clients that are snappy. They're not going to like me. It's just not going to work. So tone is one. And then the last is, well, there's one more sort of, and it's, it's how you get your information. Do you... Get it mainly from interviews? Do you get it mainly from sources? You know, how are you getting it? And then the last would be type of deliverable. Is it a type of deliverable that you're comfortable with? And actually, the real last one is personality. Are you a fit for personality? So I like clients, if you cuss during a call, then you're going to be a good fit for me, weirdly enough. So that's what you look for is like little nuances in their personality to see like, do I like this person? So the clients that I retain are ones I would have a beer with. And you don't know that from the first call, but there are calls where I'm like, I definitely know I don't want to go have a beer with you. (laughs) I have to start using that as like a requirement. Like, would I actually hang out with this person and have a conversation with them without feeling so uptight. Correct. And while, you know, you can work for a client you would have a beer with, but you're not going to necessarily work with them for long term. So you work for agencies a good amount. I think I saw, what would you say your breakout is between working directly for the client and working for agencies? It varies. It's probably 70, 30, 80, 20. Okay. And it's interesting. I haven't had the best experience working for agencies and I'm, I'm wondering if it's just, I haven't worked for the right agencies, but I find that in the tech industry, at least it seems to be very, very high pressure and they sometimes can treat writers like they're disposable. And what, what I find interesting about the dynamic is that sometimes the client is being really hard on the agency so the agency struggles to have a relationship with the client and then it kind of runs out, runs off into how they treat the writer. What has your overall experience been with agencies and have you had bad experiences? Yes, but I don't think you can generalize. I don't think it's fair to say because you had one bad experience. There's great agencies and there's crappy ones. Do you find that they they judge you like they're a little bit Do you think it's harder to get in with an agency versus a client direct? No, I think it's easier to get in with an agency. I much, I prefer agencies over direct clients. Okay. A hundred times. You can make a lot more money. They have better processes. They understand how to work with writers and you can get more work from one client and you can often, often get bigger names than you can get on your own. Yeah, for sure. That's the one thing I've definitely seen firsthand because a lot of these bigger brands, they have such strong agency relationships that they're not taking on writers directly anyway. Correct. What would you say, we'll end it on this. What would you say you do differently to nurture client relationships? Maybe it's just part of your personality, so it might be hard to judge, but what do you think is the reason why you're able to get along well with clients and that they're happy with you? It's because I pick ones. So I'm going to make typos. I just am. And I tell them this up front and I pick clients that are okay with that, but they, I'll do 24 hour turnarounds. I stayed up all night one time for a client. They paid me really well, but I mean, I like, because I'm honest about my, my strengths, my weaknesses, and I'm flexible. And I try to be myself from the very first call if somebody's turned off by me, then, then I don't want, I, I, I'm not, I'm just like we am, I might cuss, I might be funny because if they're turned off by me, they're not going to be my client. Yeah. That's one of the hardest learning lessons I've had is just 
understanding that like, yes, you really want the job. You really want to make the money. But if it's not like, if you have to pretend or you have to feel like you're on a job interview or feel super stressed out during a call, it's probably not going to be a good relationship anyway. And that's a hard lesson for newer writers who really just want to get their foot in the door. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer. I really appreciate having the opportunity. Yes. And I'll definitely link down below the Facebook group. And I'm, I know a lot of writers are going to find value in this. So thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you.